Good morning, church family. That was much better over here than over here. And for those of you online, I know you responded louder than they did, so thank you for doing that. We welcome you. For those in the patio, if you're there, great. Let's just try it again. Good morning. Oh, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Anybody cold this morning? Raise your hand. All right, well, let's warm up our hearts. Let's warm up our voices as we lift them to the Lord Jesus Christ and worship today. I want you to stand. We're going to pray us in. We've got our youth band this morning. They're going to lead us today, and let's get excited for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the joy of the Lord that can be our strength. Thank you that uh, we can gather together this morning to worship you with gladness. And, and Lord, there's a lot of distractions in the world right now, but help us to set them aside. Help us to orient our minds and our hearts and, and our emotions towards you this morning. Uh, help us to have ears to hear your word that we can be encouraged today as well. So receive our worship with gladness, God. Teach us today uh, how to live joy-filled hearts in the midst of a, a wild world as we focus our time on the gospel today. So receive what we have to offer now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me, He's not against me.
the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me. with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me this next song is about laying down our lives for God once and for all God, I give you what I can today. These catches that I hit away, I lay it all at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn your name. Show me love. I say I believe. Help me to lay it down. Oh Lord, I lay it down. Oh, let this be. Yeah. 
just lay down our lives to you today. Please just take all of our troubles and all of our hardships to you. Thank you so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I am super excited to share good news with you. Who wants to hear good news? Good. (laughs) We live at a time where there's not enough good news, amen? Well, here's my good news. To my left and your right are five white roses. What does that mean for us here at Alexandria Covenant? We have had somebody make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, and I want you to know we had five middle schoolers on Wednesday night at our uh, our Wednesday night programming Say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, and we're going to celebrate that today. So that's the good news. You know, I can recall being in middle school, even earlier than that, uh, I grew up in the church, but lived a conflicted life because I often chose rebellion over righteousness. And uh, I'll be honest, I think I asked Jesus into my heart maybe 375 times. Might be an exaggeration, but not too far, I think. You know, I always struggled with the assurance of my salvation. One of those things where I, I, I wasn't ever quite really certain of, well, which time, God, did you save me? And how can I know for sure? And how can I live with some sort of confidence so that every time I sin, I'm not running back to the cross thinking that my salvation is lost, but wondering how I can live with confidence and hope that I still was saved. Anybody else struggle with that? Anybody else wonder that? You know, for many adults, if you're honest, you still struggle with that. But today, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about our response to the gospel and the confidence that we can have in the assurance of our salvation before the Lord Jesus Christ. As you know, we've been in this gospel series, the Gospel 101. I want the chart or the graph up there. I want this imagery embedded in your mind. Why? So that as we talk about this today and into the future, that you can track where I am. Remember, it all started with God, the creator, who created a perfect world and the relationships were perfect and everything was right. But when sin showed up, it broke the relationship that humans had with God It broke the relationship the world had with God. And therefore, man and woman now live in a world of brokenness. Not only do we have brokenness around us and relationships around us, but our relationship with God is broken. And there's only one way to reconcile or make right the relationship we have with God, and that's through Jesus, the Savior. And in order for that to happen, we need to turn from our sin. We need to follow Jesus Christ so that we can enter into relationship with God the Father upon which we grow up in Christ. And once we grow in Christ, God sends us into the world to do something, to share, to share the good news of the gospel with people who still live broken lives in a broken world so they too can be reconciled to a good, righteous, and holy God. That is what the good news is really all about, and that's what we're going to talk about today, our response to the gospel. Let's pray. God, thanks so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. As we take time today to look at our response 
to the gospel, the very thing that you have done for us, Jesus, in dying on the cross in our place, taking our sin upon yourself, giving your body and shedding your blood that we could receive forgiveness of sin. You've called us to respond to this good news. As we look at that response today, encourage us through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The reality is Jesus is the only solution to our sin problem. Last week, Pastor Greg preached on Jesus the Savior. And what he told us is that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one that God sent into the world to deal with the sin problem of humanity. He reminded us that Jesus is the only name under heaven upon which we can be saved. And then he told us, That life transformation cannot happen without Jesus Christ. For in Jesus and through Jesus is the only way that we can live an experiential change of life or a transformed, renewed life because of what Christ has done for us. See, the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life and this life is in his Son, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Why do we make such a big deal about Jesus? Because if you don't have Jesus in your life, you're not saved. You don't have eternal life. You don't have the benefits of eternal life. And you can't live the gospel. But with Jesus Christ, not only do you have forgiveness of your sins... You can find a renewed life, a restored life, reconciled life to God, but you can also now live the gospel and share the gospel. Today, I want to remind you of the necessity of our response to the gospel, what that looks like and the difference that it can make in our lives. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus, he said that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is now. The king has come. That's Jesus. And this is what he says. Repent and believe in the gospel. If you're taking notes this morning, point number one is simply this. What God requires of us in response to the good news of Jesus Christ is repentance and belief. Jesus said the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance and belief, they go hand in hand. They're like two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. You need them both together. As we consider what repentance and belief is today, I'm not going to spend our whole time together unpacking those two things. There's a lot more we got to talk about. But I want to give you enough information about repentance and about belief that will help it make sense as to why they're two sides of the same coin and what difference they make in our lives. So repentance. Repentance is simply turning from something. As it relates to our salvation and our need for a Savior, it's turning from our sin. Repentance is acknowledging we have sin in our life and it's turning from it. Repentance is declaring war on the sin in our life and it's resolving to do something about it. But it's also acknowledging that on our own, we can't do enough about it. It's having a change of mind having a change of heart, having a change of attitude about our sin, and then acting accordingly. There's an action that comes with repentance. Repentance requires a posture shift in our life away from a self-gratifying life towards Christ. A couple weeks ago, if you were here, you recall, we had the two chairs up here. We only have one today, but we had two One represented a sinner saved and one unsaved. The sinner unsaved has a posture away from God always until repentance and faith becomes a reality of their life. And there's a posture shift upon which they now can pursue Christ because he has pursued them. To repent of our sin will require that we recognize the need for Jesus. That we no longer can be in control of our life. And that we're willing to give that control over to 
somebody else, namely Jesus Christ. To repent is to turn from something, but to believe is to turn to something. We flip the coin now. Belief, belief in Jesus is turning to Jesus and trusting that Jesus will be able to declare us righteous, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done for us on the cross. You know, as sinners, our greatest need is to be declared righteous by a holy God and not to be left condemned because of our sin, which is, by the way, the result of our sin nature. This is why every one of us are in trouble before a holy God because we're born into this world with a sin nature. And until Jesus does something about that for us, which he did on the cross, and we repent of sin and we turn to him, the posture of our life will never change. Only Jesus can make this happen because he satisfied God's payment for sin by dying on the cross in our place. And what was God's penalty payment needed for our sin? It was death and the shedding of blood. That's exactly what Jesus did. Sinless in every way, took the sin upon himself, went to the cross, gave his body, and shed his blood for you and me. Satisfied in 100% every way, God's penalty or payment for sin. We can't do that on our own. That's why we need to receive Christ for what he has done for us. To believe in Jesus is to rely on Jesus only to save me from my sin. It's believing Jesus for who he is, what he says he can do, and then rightly responding to him in obedience so that we can be beneficiaries of his work for us on the cross. It's a matter of transferring our reliance from ourself unto him. Let me illustrate. The chair. We can all agree this is a chair, right? You can see it. This chair is a purpose, doesn't it? The purpose of this chair is for me to sit in it and for me to trust it, that it will do what is intended to do, and that's hold me. But in order to receive the benefit from this chair, I have to shift my posture from standing on my feet to sitting in this chair. And it's in that act, upon sitting in this chair, that I demonstrate my trust that this chair can do for me what it is intended to do. It can hold me. This is true of our belief in Jesus Christ to save us from our sin. If we never transfer our trust to him through repentance of sin and faith in him, then we will remain self-reliant and dead in our sins. Many many people, they believe Jesus. They believe him for who he says he is. They even believe Jesus for what he says he can do. But too many people never take this step of transferring their reliance on him. This is the obedient life. This is the response to the gospel that God is asking of you and me. That we turn from our sin. That we turn to Jesus Christ. And that we take that step of no longer being self-reliant based on our goodness or our religious merit. But that we 100% shift our posture to be seated in Christ that we now become 100% reliant on Jesus, the work that he did on the cross as being completely sufficient to free us from the penalty of sin in our life. When we do this, when we say no to sin and yes to Jesus, and we respond to Jesus and transfer our reliance from self to him, the Bible tells us that we are now justified from what? We are justified 
in Christ, we are made righteous before a holy God. The big word that is used in theology is the term justification. Justification is the moment upon which we are declared righteous in the eyes of God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, not because of our goodness. Not even because of our decision to follow him. The decision that we make to follow him is really a response to what he has already done. But the posture shift is necessary. When we find ourselves seated in the chair, completely reliant upon Jesus for our salvation, at this very moment is when we are forgiven for our sin. We receive the Holy Spirit of the living God who now lives in us. It is at this moment that we are born again and given a new nature. We are now spiritually made alive in Christ. And we are seated with Christ. And then God seals us unto eternity so that we can forever live with God in heaven someday. That is good news. Amen? That's good news. Positionally, we are now declared holy. We are set apart from the world unto God. It happens all at this time of being justified. The moment the posture shift happens in our life and we trust in Christ. And get this, it is only then we are freed from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin, eternal condemnation, judgment to hell, away from God forever. But the moment we trust Christ is the moment we're freed from the penalty of sin in our life. I hope you can see the natical, the, the natical, the radical nature. How about that one? The radical nature of the posture shift that happens when you become a Christian. See, being justified in Christ doesn't happen through a hope and a prayer. That's why for me, praying 375 times to ask Jesus into my heart wasn't sufficient. It wasn't adequate. Because somewhere in all of that, I didn't rely on Christ for my salvation. I still relied on myself. But somewhere in that, I did make that transfer of self-reliance to relying on Christ. But it wasn't only until I, I grew up and I matured in the faith and I began to understand God's word more clearly that I found confidence and hope and assurance and that me trusting in Christ was enough for my salvation. And it was never about my goodness anyway. Justification happens only when we turn from our sin and we trust in Jesus for what he did for us. And we believe that his work on the cross alone is enough for our salvation. That's justification. And once we're justified, we enter into a relationship with God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ upon which we are now reconciled to a holy God. That's awesome, isn't it? And this leads us to our second point, being this, that following Jesus is the only way that we grow our relationship with God. See, we're not just saved from something. We're actually saved for something. True, Jesus saves us from our sin but he also saves us and separates us from the world unto a relationship with God the Father. We are now made right with him and we enter into a relationship with him. Being able to enjoy a relationship with God the Father and the person of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, who is the one who together God created the heavens and the earth and the universe and everything in it, should blow your mind. Who am I? That God would care enough about me to allow me to have a relationship with him. It should blow your mind. 1 Peter 2.24 says, 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. See, our, our, our life of being saved from sin it not only includes the salvation from sin and the judgment that comes as a result of it, but it includes being set apart unto a life of holiness or righteousness. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.15, But he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, or your translation might say, in all that you do. A holy life is a life that is no longer defined by sin. It's a life that is no longer controlled by sin. And it is a life that no longer takes pleasure in sin. A holy life or a righteous life is a life that is defined by the character or the likeness of God that is reflected now in our life as a result of Jesus living in us and living through us in the person of the Holy Spirit of the living God. The theological term for this is sanctification. The moment we get saved, we're justified. But as we enter into a relationship with God the Father and we become like Christ, we are sanctified. To sanctify something is to set it apart for special use. As it relates to God and our relationship, to sanctify us is to make us holy. To be sanctified is to become like Christ. For in the sanctified life, we are now freed, and this is important, from the power of sin. Being justified frees us from what? The penalty of sin. In the sanctified life, we are now freed from the power of sin in our life. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 6. Since we have been united with him in his death, We will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we are set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also. So you also. So you also should consider yourselves dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. That is powerful, isn't it? It's a loss of one power and a gain of a new power. The power of sin no longer grips us, but the power of Christ now lives in us. Remember, positionally, when we're justified, we no longer have the the, the penalty of sin that we, we have due to us. But in the sanctified life, we're freed from the power of sin and given the power of God that is at work in us sanctifying us, making us holy, making us righteous. As we become more like Christ in our maturing and growing relationship with God over time. Now, this doesn't mean that we will stop sinning. 1 John 1.10 says that if we, we say that we have sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. True, we won't stop sinning, but another truth is we will stop sinning less. We can't see ourselves as sinless, but we need to see ourselves as people who will sin less. And that our new nature being born in God will help us every day to act and to look and to be more like Christ. As we submit ourselves and subject ourselves to the word of God in our life. 
I don't know about you, but when you became a Christian, I imagine you didn't stop sinning immediately, did you? Nor did I. God had to do a sanctifying work in my life. He needed to take the sin of my life that oftentimes defined my life and change me and renew me. Have you ever led somebody to Jesus, to Jesus and discipled them? And one of the things that you constantly were nagging them all about was, oh, you can't do that. You can't say that. You can't, like, you're just freaked out because, like, they're now a Christian and they're living horribly. Yeah, that was me when I got saved. <laughs> God had to work me over. I would even argue that as soon as you become a Christian, the battle really begins. How long is it going to last? How long will we sin as Christians? I'll tell you, the Bible has an answer for this. Until the day we die. The day we die, we enter the presence of Christ. It's called glorification. And the very thing that we lose is our sin nature. The other thing we lose is the presence of sin in our life. Hear this. The moment we're justified in Christ, we lose the penalty of sin. We're freed from the penalty of sin. In the sanctified life, the life as a Christian here on earth, we're freed from the power of sin. And the moment we die and we enter into eternity with Christ, we're glorified. And it's then that we're freed from the presence of sin. That should give us hope. But while we're here on earth, Christ is going to sanctify us. He's going to purify us. And in this sanctified life, sin no longer has power over us. So we can choose, we can choose to say no to sin. Why? Because of the power of Christ that is alive in us. See, God calls us. He equips us. He gives us his power, his spirit. He tests us. He gives us the ability to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. For many Christians, we battle a long time after our conversion to say no to certain sins in our life. For me, it took a while before I could lose the grip that pornography had on me. It took a while to clean up my mouth because I talked and I cussed like a sailor. It took a while for me to say no to running after women and booze and saying yes to the life that God wanted me to live. You know, for many of us, alcoholism, pornography, gambling, gossip, lying, stealing, lust, language, racism, you know what, you name your sin. Which one is your struggle? I can assure you, you're not alone. You're not alone. But in your struggle, God has given you his word. He has given you the Holy Spirit of the living God. He's freed you from the power of sin in your life. And he's put you in the church. And he's put people in your life for you to rely on, depend on, have to share your burden and to walk with you and to talk with you and to encourage you. I have that. I need that. I had it. I needed it. I continue to have it. Why? Because it's the way God works things out in our life. It's the way he sanctifies us. It's the way he purifies us. Oftentimes working through sin issues in our life, as Christians especially, Christians, can cause us to question our salvation. It can cause us to doubt whether or not we're truly saved. I want to remind you that if you're going to deal with the sin issue in your life by yourself, it's no different than moving from a posture of being seated in Christ and trusting in him to forgive you of your sin and then getting up and dealing with the sin issue on your own. And when we walk this journey after being forgiven and freed from the penalty of sin, as we walk about our lives trying to fix it and be good and change it on our own, we live with doubt, we live with wonder, we live with worry, we live with fear. But God's calling us back. He's saying, no, 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 no. Sit down. Rest in me. Let the work of my Holy Spirit change your heart, change your mind, change your attitude. Oh, and also, let the work of my word change you as well. Show you how to live rightly. 
It's important that we understand the work of the Spirit and the work of the Word go together in our life. Holiness in the Christian life happens through these ways. As the Word works us over and the Spirit changes us, and then we respond in obedience to the Word and the work of Christ in our life. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. It's part of Jesus' prayer. Your word is truth. See, people will know that we are Christians by the fruit of our salvation. Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 says, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. And then he goes on to define the fruit of the salvation and listen to his definition. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. The fruit of our salvation is evident in our love for God, in our love for others. If you've not responded to the gospel and you're living a life for yourself, you won't love God and you won't love others. But the evidence of our salvation is that we love God, that we're loving others. It's seen in our repentance from sin, our devotion to God, in our humility and gentleness towards others. It's seen in our prayer life, our willingness to obey the word and live it out, our hunger for God's word. And where the world really sees it, is in the transformation of our lives. Because that's what the work of the Holy Spirit does. He changes us from the inside out. Get this. When the Holy Spirit's at work in you and you say yes to righteousness and no to sin, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is what the world wants and they'll never find it and they'll never get it on their own. But when we subject ourselves to the rule of Christ in our life, this is the life that we get to live. A sanctified life is one where Jesus is both Savior and Lord of your life. A Sunday school teacher, I read a story about a Sunday school teacher who once said, a throne and a cross live in every human heart. If Christ is on the throne, self must be on the cross. For us Christians, we get that, right? We're no longer self-reliant, but we're reliant on Christ. So if Christ is on the throne of our heart, we are now on the cross. And what are we doing on the cross? We're not dying again for our sin, no. We're giving up our old life. We're dying to ourself so that we can live the life that God has for us to live. But if self is on the throne, Christ will be on the cross. Christ has taken our place. Only in Christ is the penalty of our sin forgiven. He accomplished it. 100% satisfied. God's requirement of sin payment. Jesus did it for us. Who's on the throne of your life? Are you or is Christ? If Christ is on the throne of your life, then make sure you live your life on the cross, dying to self so that you can live for Jesus. Lastly, third point, following Jesus includes that we share the good news about Jesus with others. This too is part of the sanctified life, by the way. This is not something you get to get out of as a Christian. Remember that that as a sanctified person, God has set us apart. He set you apart from the world unto God to be used by God for a special purpose. That is you if you've responded to the gospel. You are special in the eyes of God and he has a special thing for you to do on this earth. And one of the special assignments that he has given to all of us is to go into the world and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. 
Listen to how Paul says it in Romans 10, 14 and 15. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. Are your feet beautiful? I don't want to see your feet. I don't like feet, by the way. But what makes our feet beautiful as Christians is when they're actively at work, going into the world, sharing the good news of people with Jesus, uh, 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 of others, to others, of what Jesus has done for them. One of the greatest ways that we can share the love of Christ with others is simply by telling our story. Did you know that as a Christian, you have a testimony? You have a testimony of how God has called you and changed you and all that he's doing inside of you. That is good news story of the gospel at work in your life. You see, the good news isn't just for you and it's not just for me, even though it's for you and me, it's for the whole world. So don't hold the good news once you get it to yourself. Be willing to tell the world of the good news of the work of God in your life and that he has a work to do in their life. Let me remind you, what does God require of us in response to the gospel? That we repent, we turn from our sin, and we turn towards Jesus in belief, trusting him. It's a posture shift in our life. It's one upon which we now are seated in Christ. This is the moment we're justified. We're spiritually born again. We're made new. And then we live the sanctified life from this position. We enter into a relationship with God the Father through the person of Christ. And we become holy through the work of the Spirit and the Word in our life. Part of that sanctified life. It's going into the world, telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. I got to tell you, one thing this world needs right now is people with joy in their heart that can be seen through their lives, their actions, and their face, even though you can't see our faces. If you're a grumpy Christian, number one, take this gently, Knock it off. Number two, maybe you need to change your mind and your heart and your attitude about what's going on in the world today. There's a lot of things we can't change that I don't like, that you don't like, that make a mess of everything, including our lives. But we all have the ability to make sure that our heart that our mind, and that our attitude are in Christ. God's being taken out of everything. Don't let God not use you because you've chosen to have a bad attitude about what's going on in the world. Because if your testimony is hindered by your attitude, then guess what? You're taken out too. The world's not going to see Jesus in you. They're going to see somebody who says, I'm a Christian, but arr, who wants that? In light of all that's going on, be humble, be gentle, be loving, encourage one another. Remind people of the joy that we can have in any and all situation and circumstance because of what Christ has done for us. God's given us every ability to live in a chaotic and crazy world. In fact, he even told us it's going to get crazy out there and people are going to hate you because they hate me. But don't lose heart. Persevere in the faith. Find the joy in any and all situation and circumstances in life. 
And make sure that your feet are beautiful. Make sure that you live into God's expectation for your life of being a messenger of the gospel. And if you're going to be a messenger bringing good news and you're roaring at people, <laughs> I'll bet they're not going to hear the good news. What they're going to hear is your grumpiness. I'll be honest. God's had to work me over in this area. I'm not real excited about what's going on in the world either. But I'm changing my attitude. I'm changing my mind. And I'm changing my heart. Because I got to lead you. And I can't lead you if I'm going to be a jerk to others. And I'm going to have a bad attitude about what's going on. This isn't a call for you to get fixed. <laughs> for me too. Can we do this? Are you willing to do this? I hope so. I'm willing. I'm going to invite you with me. Let's go change the world through the message that can. Let's bring the gospel, the good news to others. Amen? Let's pray. God, thanks so much for your word. So powerful, so encouraging. It gives us everything we need to live the life that you have for us to live. You've called us to receive and respond to the good news. And when we do that, we don't have to rely on ourselves anymore. We get to rely on you. We get to allow your work to happen in our life and we get to depend on your word. And there's just so many great things that are the result of us being able to live with you now in a reconciled relationship. Help us to find the joy in that and, and to be willing to share that joy with others. Our thanks for your gospel. It has the power to change lives. We know that. It's changed ours. Help us to be messengers with beautiful feet that share that good news so that others' lives can be changed as well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing and worship as we close this service today.
the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Amen. That is good news. Amen. Now I want to remind you, we've got announcements on the slide behind us. If you want our online bulletin, you can text ACC News to 77222. We're going to direct you to our website for all information related to what's happening in the life of the church. As you leave today, there'll be ushers taking the offering at the door. But let me remind you, in the cross and in Christ, as we respond to the gospel, we are freed from the penalty of sin. And in Christ and through Christ, we are freed from the power of sin. And we are to take the message of the cross that has changed our life, and we are to share it with the world. Will you be messengers with beautiful feet? I leave that with a challenge, as a challenge for you today. Make sure you don't hinder the testimony of Christ in your life because of your attitude, your choices, or the way you're living your life. God's, God has called us to a life of holiness. Let's respond to the Spirit's work in our life and obey the Word of God. And we can do just that. Blessings on your day. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you next week.